Good evening again, everyone. You all have the study guide, yes or no? Okay, tonight is the first of a two-part series in which we're going to be discussing the biblical topic of the Antichrist. And I want to let you know that we will be revealing, not tomorrow night, but the following night, precisely who the Antichrist is. And you're sitting there thinking, what? I mean, is he really going to say it? Is he going to tell us who the Antichrist is? The answer is no. You're going to tell me who it is. Because we're going to put all of the biblical identifiers up there, and you will see there is only one power, only one individual that can meet all of those specifications. And I'm not whistling Dixie when I say, you will tell me who it is. Are we clear on that, everyone? Okay, but before we get right into that, this is the first part tonight. And before we talk about the identity of the Antichrist, what we're going to do this evening is talk a little bit about the principle behind Antichrist. What does that even mean? Many people have a, a very wrong idea of what it even means to talk about an Antichrist. They say, oh, well, here's Jesus Christ, and so the Antichrist would be someone against Christ, right? That's what they think. Well, we're going to discover tonight that that is an overly simplistic definition of what the Antichrist is. And our message is entitled, Does Jesus Christ Have a Twin? Now, is that kind of an unusual title, yes or no? And you're going to discover tonight why we give it that somewhat unusual title. Now, before we get right into the Bible proper, what are we going to do first? Pray. So let's do that together. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you just now. We want to confess that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We want to confess, Father, that it is not our own intelligence and our own education that will enable us to understand your word. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so, Father, tonight we need you to come into this room to give us your Holy Spirit that we may understand your word correctly and aright. Father, as we open your word, may you open our hearts and teach us great and mighty and true things. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go directly to our study guide. If you need a study guide, you can raise your hands, and I think the ushers would be glad to get you one. Discover prophecy number seven, does Jesus Christ have a twin? Let's begin in the introductory paragraph there. This lesson and the following lesson will address the very important issue of the what, everyone? The Antichrist from a what kind of perspective? Biblical perspective. Conjectures, opinions, and ideas about the Antichrist, the identity of the Antichrist abound. And I'll be perfectly candid with you, much of it is rubbish. Much of it is not based upon the Bible. Much of it is not based upon the Scriptures. And you'll be seeing that over the course of the next two meetings. We are not interested in opinions. Can you say amen? amen? We want to know the truth. We want to know what the Bible actually teaches. This is, of course, a serious topic, so we want to be sure to be honest and humble in our study. God will richly bless us if we seek to do this. Now, let's talk about simple salvation as we begin this evening. Perhaps the simplest salvation text in all of the Bible is John chapter 17 and verse 3. Now fill in the blanks there and I'll quote it for you. Jesus was speaking and he said, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I'll repeat it again. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. In other words, the essence, the distillation of salvation is to know God and to be in a faith relationship with Him. Can you say amen? amen. We talked about that last night. So, so here's Jesus Christ. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is life eternal, to know God, to have a relationship of trust and of faith with God. In its simplest distillation, salvation is to know God. Can you say amen? amen? Okay, so we're asking the question tonight, does Jesus, does he have a twin? Now I'm back to the study guide here. It says, there it is, simple, having a faith relationship with him. To know God is to have salvation. To not know God is to fail of experiencing salvation. As we shall see, the thrust of Satan's attack through the Antichrist is to prevent individuals from coming to know God personally and, what's that next word? Truly. Truly. 
This is precisely why we spent the last three lessons grounding ourselves in the cross of Jesus Christ and its prophetic importance. Knowing who the Antichrist is won't save anyone. Can you say amen? amen. Knowing who Jesus Christ is, however, will result in salvation. Now, I want you to think about this. It's very simple. In fact, it's, it's so easy to understand that my little five-year-old boy could understand it. If salvation comes from knowing God, then Satan is going to try to prevent us from knowing God and thus obtaining salvation. Does that make sense, everyone? And what we're going to discover is that the thrust of the Antichrist's attack is to prevent us from knowing God personally and truly. Does that make sense, everyone? Very, very simple. And so we're asking the question tonight, does Jesus Christ have a twin? This is an artist's portrayal of the Antichrist beast of Revelation chapter 13. Now, does this look like Jesus' twin? Now, of course, we don't know exactly what Jesus looked like. The picture that we just had up there a moment ago was an artist's representation. But we can be very confident that this beast with the body of a leopard, the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, I mean, this horrific, strange, amalgamated beast surely is not Jesus' twin. Now, go back to your study guide there, and it says, Are you deceived? Are you sure? Are you deceived? Are you sure? Never forget this. The essence of deception is that you are unaware you are being deceived. Did you catch that, everyone? Yes or no? The essence of deception is that you are unaware you are being deceived. For example, you never see anyone walking around with a sign around their neck that says, I'm being deceived. Because if they had a sign around their neck that said, I'm being deceived, it means they know it. And by definition, deception is when you don't know it. Does that make sense, everyone? It's a little bit like this. Think of sleeping. Have you ever noticed that you didn't know you were asleep until you wake up? Try that experiment at your home sometime. Okay? You, you, you suddenly have the awareness, oh, I was asleep. But you don't have that awareness until you have a perspective of being awake. Does that make sense, everyone? So the only way you would ever know if you were deceived is to get undeceived. Are we all clear on that? Now, you might be sitting here tonight and thinking, whoo, I'm glad I'm not deceived. The problem is that's exactly how deceived people think. Are we clear? So the essence of deception is that you are unaware that you are being Deceived. That's exactly right. That's why we say, are you being deceived? You say, no. Are you sure? How would you know? Look at the study guide there, down to the bottom. The problem is that this is exactly how deceived people think. How can we be sure that we will remain undeceived? Simple. Be sure that everything you believe is consistent with the Bible. Bible. The Bible is the cure for deception. The Bible is the what, everyone? The cure for deception. Don't trust what a man says. We spent a little time on that the other evening, and we put that picture up there of Dr. Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda, who claims to be Jesus on earth, who claims to be Christ on earth, and who has an estimated 1 to 10 million followers. Are those people deceived that are following that man, yes or no? Do they think they're deceived? And that's the point. That is the, how could they become undeceived by listening to him? No, 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 by listening to the Bible. That's exactly right. We're on the second page there. The apostle, the apostle Paul and the Antichrist. What did the apostle Paul have to say about this? Well, first of all, let's talk about this whole concept of Antichrist. Again, we've already said that some people think, oh, this will be elementary, this will be easy, this will be a piece of cake. Here's Jesus Christ, and whoever is against Jesus Christ in sort of a violent opposition, well, that's clearly the Antichrist. Now, beloved, is the devil that stupid, yes or no? Hardly. In fact, what we're going to discover tonight is that the prefix anti from the Latin anti does not mean against. Notice the actual definition here from Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Instead of or because of in the room of. B. Often used in composition to denote contrast, requital. What's that next word? substitution, correspondence, etc. So look, at definition A, instead of, definition B, as a substitute. So anti is not this elementary, simple definition, one who is against. The antichrist is one who tries to substitute for Christ. Are we clear on that, everyone? Yes or no? 
Not somebody who violently opposes, but somebody who subtly betrays. Now, more on that in just a moment, but open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's in the New Testament. You can find it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and here we find the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica, warning them about an antichrist power, an antichrist figure. 2 Thessalonians, what chapter, everyone? Chapter 2. Now, we'll pick it up in verse 3. He says, let no one, what's that word? Deceive. deceive you. So Paul was concerned about deception, wasn't he? Let no one deceive you by any means for that day. In the context, that day is the second coming. For that day will not come unless a falling away comes first. Unless a what, everyone? A falling away. Now, the Greek word here for falling away is apostasia. In other words, or apostia. It means to divorce. To what, everyone? Divorce. To divorce. That's exactly what he's saying. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a divorce comes first. Now, I want you to think about that here for just a moment. Could you divorce someone that you were never married to? Yes or no? That would be impossible. So think about it this way. In order to have a divorce, you must first have had a prior favorable relationship. Are we all on the same page there? And so my wife is sitting right here in the front row, and I would never think of divorcing her because she's the best wife I've ever had. I like to tell people she's my first wife, okay? And so, could, but could I get a divorce from her? God forbid. Is that possible? Yes. Sure. That's, but she's sitting next to my friend Andrea, who I've never been married to. Now, could I get a, a divorce from Andrea? No, 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 no. So the moment you start talking about divorce, you know automatically there must have been a prior favorable relationship. Is that clear, everyone? Yes or no? So look, he says, don't let anyone deceive you for that day. What day? The second coming of Jesus will not come until a falling away or a divorce comes first. Now notice this. And the man of sin is revealed. That's the Antichrist. The son of what? Perdition. The son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Notice it doesn't say so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he's against God. It doesn't say that at all. It says he goes into the temple of God to show that he is God. Is that the idea of against and opposition or is that the idea of substitution? Substitution. You've got it. Now, I want you to notice something very interesting there. On your study guide, there are two phrases, two names that the Apostle Paul used to refer to this Antichrist power. Number one was the man of sin, and the other one is the son of, what was it, everyone? Perdition. Perdition. Now, notice the paragraph there. What is the significance of that second name? That name, son of perdition, occurs only one other place in the Bible. It's in John chapter 17 and verse 12. The only other person in the Bible referred to as the son of perdition is Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. I'll quote it for you very quickly. Jesus was praying in the garden. He said, Father, of all that thou hast given me, I have lost none but one, the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And so when the Apostle Paul here uses this term, son of perdition, he is thinking of the language of Jesus referring to Judas as the son of perdition. Only two figures in all of scripture referred to by that name, the Antichrist and Judas Iscariot. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, now look at this. You can fill in your blanks there. But watch this. Judas Iscariot did not violently oppose Jesus Christ. Rather, he subtly, what? Betrayed him. He came not from the violent opposition of the Pharisees or the Romans, but from the very inner circle of Christ's followers, the disciples. He looked friendly, but secretly he betrayed. Now, when the Apostle Paul here uses the term son of perdition to refer to the Antichrist, what he's saying is don't expect a violent political opposer. Hardly. No one's going to fall for that. Remember, the issue at the end of time is the issue of worship. The issue of what, everyone? Yes. Worship. And so don't expect a violent opposition to Jesus Christ. If that's what you're looking for, you think that's going to be Antichrist, wrong, you missed it. 
He employs the analogy of the son of perdition of Judas Iscariot because Judas Iscariot came from within the inner sanctum not to oppose Christ, but to betray him. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? Hey, wow, that goes along perfectly with that language he had just used, that a falling away or a divorce. A what, everyone? A divorce. And so we're getting this idea, anti is a substitute. Anti is one who stands in the place of, like a Judas Iscariot who would subtly betray and there would be a divorce. Rather than violent opposition, we're looking at subtle betrayal. And that's exactly what we have here. The Antichrist will not appear as a violent opposer, but as a subtle imposter. The Antichrist will not appear as a violent opposer, but as a subtle imposter. This is very, very important to grasp. You can fill those in on your blanks there. Notice also, according to verse 4, the Antichrist goes into the temple of God, not to show himself that he is against God, but rather that he is God. You've got it. Next paragraph. Another important text taken from a sermon by Paul preached in Ephesus is found in Acts 20, verses 28 to 30. And we've got that on the screen here for you. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 30. This is Paul preaching, Luke writing. Paul knows that he's on his way to Rome. On, or actually, he's on his way to Jerusalem where he'll be betrayed and then he's going to Rome. Okay, now watch this, verse 28. Therefore, Paul says, take heed, he's speaking to the elders of the church in Ephesus. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. He says, you're the leaders of the church. Take heed to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with what, everyone? His own blood. So Paul is talking to the leaders of the church. He's talking to who, everyone? The leaders of the church. Notice the next verse, verse 29. For I know this that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now that must have been shocking to them, but what he said next must have been very shocking. Verse 30, also from among the Romans. Is that what it says? Also from among the Pharisees. Is that what it says? No, 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 no. From among the heathen. Is that what it says? No, no, no. Also from among yourselves. Men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Paul was concerned that there would be a falling away within the church itself. Are we all clear on that, everyone? He says, hey, listen, I know that after my departure, savage wolves are going to come in among the flock. Even from among your own selves will men arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples of the Lord after themselves. And so we're getting this picture in our mind here of a subtle betrayal rather than a violent opposition. Are we all clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, let's continue on then. Here Paul says that these coming deceivers would arise from within the church. From where, everyone? Within the church, just like Judas. I mean, where did Judas come from? Was he a violent opposer, or was he from within the very inner circle? The inner circle, you've got it. Just like Judas Iscariot, the conflict comes from inside betrayal, not from outside overt opposition. Now, before we go to the book of Revelation, remember that the dividing issue in the book of Revelation is what, everyone? Worship. It deals with the issue of worship. Remember also that Satan uses the Antichrist as a front man in order to procure what he has always wanted. And what has Satan wanted there since his fall? Worship. That's exactly right. Remember the, the highest form of his intoxication, the highest form of his audacity was there in the wilderness when he said to Jesus himself, all this will I give you if you just fall down and worship me. I mean, height of follies. Here the created is asking the creator to worship him. I mean, total insanity. This is the longing desire of Satan's perverted heart is to receive worship. But we've already said it. If the devil walked in here tonight and said, Hey, everyone, nice to have you all here. My name's Satan, and I want you to bow down and worship me. Would you do it? No. He'd say, No, we're not going to do it. The devil, does he know that? No. Of course he knows that. And so what he does is he gets himself a front man. 
A what, everyone? A front man, and he props him up, and when he props up that front man by giving him, as we saw in Revelation 13 the other night, his power, his throne, his great authority, when the beast is worshipped, who really is being worshipped? Satan himself, absolutely. It's called worship by representation. Now, just think about that for a moment. I'm going to quote a few words of Jesus for you here. Jesus said, no man comes unto the Father but by me. Beloved, how do we worship the Father in spirit and in truth? We worship Jesus Christ, amen? We worship Jesus. Jesus is our representative before the throne, and the Father gave His power, His throne, His great authority to Jesus. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28? All power is given unto me in heaven on in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. In other words, the way that we have access to the Father is through Jesus Christ. Amen? So we worship Jesus in spirit and in truth, and that worship is transferred to His Father because He's the representative of His Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In fact, it's actually quite powerful. You have a counterfeit trinity in the book of Revelation. How many of you knew that? There's a counterfeit trinity right in the book of Revelation. In the nature of God, you have Father... Son and Holy Spirit. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, some people say, well, the Bible never says the word Trinity. Of course the Bible doesn't use the word Trinity. It's a contraction of two words, tri, which means three, and divinity, which is God. The Bible actually uses the word Godhead. And somebody says, well, I don't like the word Trinity. Then I have a good piece of advice for you. Don't use it. <laughs> right? If you go to the doctor and you say, oh, doc, oh, when, my, when I bend my arm like this, ooh, that just hurts when I... Oh, I just can't bend it back like that. Any good doctor is going to say, don't move your arm like that. Are you with me? So if you don't like the word Trinity, hey, you don't have to use it. Instead, use the biblical word, and that word is Godhead. That word is what, everyone? But what it says is that God is three in one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But when you come to the book of Revelation, do you know what you have? You have the dragon, which is Satan, the false prophet, and the beast. Just as you have a real Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there is a triunity in the book of Revelation of a satanic trinity, the dragon, the false prophet, and the beast. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, there are so many. This counterfeit theme is amazing in the book of Revelation. Take, for example, God has a city. That city is New Jerusalem. Ah! Satan has a city, that's Babylon, spiritual Babylon. God has a church, and you find that in Revelation chapter 12, a chaste woman who's adorned with the sun and the moon, and, or pardon me, she's standing on the moon, the sun and the stars. And then you go to Revelation 17, and the devil has a church, a harlot who's decked with all kinds of gaudy jewelry, etc. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? So you have this counterfeit theme. What, everyone? Counterfeit. And now you can begin to see, oh, that's why they asked the question, does Jesus Christ have a twin? I'm on page three. Does Jesus Christ have a twin? The book of Revelation, as we would expect, agrees perfectly with what Paul says about the Antichrist. We discover that the Antichrist is a religious entity that seeks to obscure the true place and person of Jesus Christ. You say, wait a minute, how do you know it's a religious entity? Because he goes into the temple of God to show himself that he is God. I mean, if you're showing yourself as God, that would make you a religious entity, yes or no? Absolutely, of course. And uh, notice as we go on here. In fact, strange as it may seem, the Antichrist actually seeks to impersonate Jesus Christ. This is portrayed very clearly in Revelation, and this is why the lesson is entitled, Does Jesus Christ Have a Twin? Of course, the answer to that question is no. But the way the Antichrist seeks to ape Jesus, one would wonder. And here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to compare the picture of the Antichrist beast in Revelation chapter 13 with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to look at eight points of counterfeit. Eight points of what, everyone? Counterfeit. And, and you can begin to write them down now. We're going to actually look at them on, uh, in your Bible. We're going to have them here up on the screen so you can write them down, and we'll look at them directly in your Bible. Let's note number one. Jesus began his earthly ministry by rising from the water. Is that true? 
Jesus began his earthly ministry. He went down there to the, to the waters of the river Jordan. He walked up to John. He said, John, I need to be baptized by you. He said, I can't baptize you. I can't even unloose your sandals. And he said, suffer it to be so for now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness sake. And Jesus was baptized and coming up out of the water, according to Matthew chapter 3, there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and then Jesus goes out into the wilderness and from that day forward begins his public ministry begins his what public ministry that's exactly right so Jesus begins his public ministry by rising from the waters of baptism now look at Revelation chapter 13 Revelation chapter 13 keep your finger all night right in Revelation chapter 13 because we're going to spend all night in this chapter okay so if you've got one of these little ribbons here, you just keep your, your finger or a pen or something right in there, Revelation chapter 13, because we'll be flipping back and forth from other passages in the Bible to Revelation 13. I'm reading in verse 1, Revelation chapter 13 in verse 1. John says, Then I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Interesting. Here the beast is depicted by John as rising up from the water to begin his mission to deceive and destroy. Notice the parallel. Jesus Christ begins his ministry to save by rising from the waters of baptism. The Antichrist begins his ministry symbolically to deceive and to destroy by rising from the water. Is that clear, everyone? Number two. Jesus Christ resembles his father. Jesus Christ resembles his father. We've already quoted it for you. I'll quote again. This is John chapter 14. Jesus says, Philip, have I been so long time with you that you have not seen the father? He who has seen me has seen the father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. I'll give you several other verses to write down there. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3, where the author of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the express image of God. The express image image. Here's another verse you can write down. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, where the Apostle Paul says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus resembles his Father. Can you say amen? Not just in a physical sense, but if you had seen him, seen his love, seen his kindness, seen his care, seen his munificence, you have seen the character of the Father. Amen? But the Antichrist resembles Satan. Look there in Revelation chapter 13 again. Notice what it says. Revelation chapter 13 then I stood upon the sand of the sea, verse 1, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having how many heads? Seven heads and how many horns? Ten horns. And what did he have on his horns? Ten crowns and a blasphemous name. Now keep your finger right here and go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. In fact, I don't even have to turn the page in my Bible. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Actually, we'll look at it. we can look at it in several places here. Pick it up in verse 3. Let's read in verse 3. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. It says, Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon. Now, according to verse 9, who's the dragon? So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Okay, so back to verse 3. It says, Another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having how many heads? Seven heads and how many horns? Ten horns. And what did he have on his horns? Crowns. Do you see the similarity, yes or no? The Antichrist beast is depicted symbolically as having seven heads. He has ten horns and he has crowns upon those horns. He looks just like the dragon. The dragon has how many heads? Seven heads. How many horns? Ten horns. How many crowns? Doesn't say exactly, but crowns on those horns. Probably ten. So, just as Jesus Christ resembles the Father, the Antichrist resembles who? Satan. Now, we've already said several times tonight, we've just looked at the verse right here, that the Antichrist has horns and crowns. Has what, everyone? Horns and crowns. Did you know that in the book of Revelation, Jesus is depicted as having horns and crowns? 
Look at this. You're right there in Revelation. Keep your finger in 13. Go to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Many of you already know this verse by heart. If I began to quote for you verse 16, he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So you know this vision already. Now look at verse 12. It says, His eyes, this is speaking of Jesus, were like a flame of fire, and on His head was many crowns. Now, you, you can be sure it's Jesus. Jump down to verse 13. The Lord was God. So this is Jesus on that white stallion riding back to conquer his foes, to conquer His enemies, to conquer His adversaries. And it says He has many crowns. Go to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. And here we find a marvelous, marvelous vision. In Revelation chapter 4, John sees this throne. He sees a what, everyone? A throne. And then in Revelation chapter 5, he begins to weep because there's this scroll and there's something about that scroll. And he knows that that scroll needs to be opened, but no one was found worthy to open the scroll. And then the lion of the tribe of Judah appears. Are we all together? Verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Can you say amen? amen. Verse 6, Then I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a amen. lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns. Seven horns. Now, of course, this is symbolic here. Now, let's think about what was a horn in the mind of the Israelites. You find that many times. For example, in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, it would say things like, Oh, God, raise up a horn of salvation. You think, what does that mean, raise up a horn of salvation? It's actually very simple. The, the Israelites and the Jewish people and others in ancient Palestine, they had goats and they would see these, these uh, different kinds of goats up on the rocks. They were, they, they, they were when, when mating season would come, they would smash their heads into one another, right? You've seen the rams do that where they sort of rear back and do that thing, right? And, and in the mind of the ancient Israelite, the one with the larger horns tended to prevail. And so the horn came to symbolize strength. The horn came to symbolize power. Does that make sense? And so when it says here that this lamb has seven horns, seven is a very important number in the book of Revelation, by the way. There are seven trumpets, seven seals, seven plagues. I mean, seven, 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 all throughout the book of Revelation. It's like God is trying to say something about seven. Pay attention to the number seven, he says. Seven, seven, seven. But here it says he has seven horns. Seven is the number of completion. The number of what? Complete. It's the perfect number. The earth was created and, and constructed in how many days? Seven days. It's that number of fullness, of completion. And so here this lamb is in the midst of the throne, and he has a horn, which means strength and power, and he has seven of them, which means he has perfect strength and power. So far, so good? And so Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation is depicted as having horns and crowns. Now think about a crown. Who wears a crown? A king wears a crown. And so, when a king has a crown and has a horn symbolically, this would represent kingly power. Kingly what, everyone? Power. And so the Antichrist is depicted as having kingly power, and Jesus Christ, as the king of kings, is depicted as having kingly power. Can you say amen? amen. Point number three. Now look at point number four. Jesus Christ receives his authority from who, everyone? The Father. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew, first book of the New Testament, last chapter of that book. Matthew chapter 28. Okay? Say amen when you get there. Matthew 28. You're flipping, 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 trying to write, trying to flip, trying to keep up. You can do it. You can do it. Amen? <laughs> See, I'll slow down when that clock slows down. The moment that clock starts slowing down, then I'll slow down. But the clock isn't slowing down, so I can't slow down, okay? Matthew chapter 28, and notice with me verse 18. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Question, who gave Jesus all authority? God did. That's exactly right. And so Jesus receives authority from the 
Father. Now, very quickly while we're here, just look up at verse 17, just very quickly, so we don't have to come back here. It says, and when they saw him, they what? They worshipped him, but some doubted. Hang on to that. Take that verse, verse 17, and hang it on a hook in your mind. We're going to come back to it. Okay? Verse 4. Jesus receives his authority from the Father. Okay? Go to Revelation chapter 13. You've still got your finger in there, so you should be able to just flip right back like I just did. Revelation chapter 13. And I am in verse 1. Then I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. You're thinking, whoa, where's all this coming from? You've got to hang in there. In fact, we're going to spend a whole lot of time on that on Monday. Okay, but look at this. It says, the dragon. Who's the dragon, everyone? Satan. The dragon gave him. Who's him? The Antichrist beast, notice this, his power and his throne and his great authority. Now, I want you to think about that. That's, that's amazing. What did we just learn in our presentation last night? Satan wanted to go up or down. He wanted to go up, up, up. I will exalt my throne and I will go up, 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 up. We had that, that picture yesterday, a powerful presentation, and Jesus Christ is willing to go down. So Satan here apparently finally gets his throne, and when he gets his throne, what does he do with it? He gives it away. Look at it in verse 2. It says, the dragon gave him, the Antichrist, his power and his throne and his great authority, the very thing he wanted to obtain, he gets it only to give it away. Why is he so quick to give it away? Because he knows no one will worship Satan as Satan. Can someone say amen? And so he gets himself a religious front man called the Antichrist. Not one who's against Christ, but one who's in the place of Christ. He props him up, sets him up real good. says, you have my throne, you have my power, you have my great authority. He steps back. So when he's worshipped, who really is worshipped? You got it. So Jesus Christ received his authority from the Father, and the Antichrist receives his authority, his throne, and his power from none other than Satan himself. Do you see the parallels, everyone? Yes or no? Powerful. In fact, this counterfeit theme is a consistent theme in all of Revelation. Many scholars have brought this out. It's, it's impossible to miss. God has a city. Satan has a city. God, has, uh, uh, God is triune. Satan has a triune uh, counterfeit, etc. Now notice this. Crowns indicate kingly authority, as we've already said. We go now to the last four. Okay? The last uh, five or four, pardon me. Beginning at number five, Jesus Christ's ministry lasted three and a half years. Jesus Christ's ministry lasted three and a half years. How many years, everyone? Three and a half. Now, you say, well, where's the verse that says that? There's not a single verse that says that. You have to study the Gospels, particularly the Gospel of John, and you see that there were three Passovers that took place during the ministry of Jesus. Now, Jesus was baptized in the fall of 27 A.D., Okay, listen. The fall of what, everyone? 27. 27 A.D. Now watch my fingers here very carefully. He's baptized in the fall of 27 A.D., okay? Then the fall of 28 would be one year. That's one Passover. The fall of 29 would be two years. That's another Passover. The fall of 30, and then half a year, three and a half years, three Passovers. Baptized in the fall, crucified in the spring. Passover took place in the spring. Are we all clear on that? I mean, it would take me probably 15 or 20 minutes to show you that out of John, but you can look at it yourself. Just look up the word Passover in a concordance through the book of John. There were three Passovers. Jesus' ministry lasted approximately three and a half years from being baptized in the fall of 27 A.D. and crucified in the spring of 31 A.D. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? Very powerful. In fact, if I had time, I could show it to you very easily. Now look at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 and this beast here, verse 5, Revelation 13, verse 5, it says, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for how many months? Forty-two months. This is one of the most important time periods in all of the Bible. In fact, this time period occurs seven times in the Bible. Seven times, and it's always in the book of Daniel and Revelation. Sometimes it's called the 42 months, sometimes it's called the 1,260 days, and sometimes it's called a time, times, and half a time. Now, how many years would 42 months be? Three and a half, that's exactly right, because one year would be 12, two years would be 
24, three years would be 36, and then half of that would be six, and that would be 42. So how long does the mission, the prophetic mission of the Antichrist figure last? Three and a half. You've got it. So we have Jesus' ministry last three and a half literal years. The Antichrist's mission to deceive lasts three and a half prophetic years. Okay, very, very powerful. Now go to uh, number six. Jesus was slain, then resurrected. Do I have to go to a verse to show you that? You know that. Amen? Jesus Christ was slain, and he was resurrected. You say, well, what? You, are you saying the Antichrist was slain? Oh, yeah, sure. Look at your Bible. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. John says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. Okay, if you're reading, I think, the King James, it says, wounded to death. Is that what it says? Okay, a mortal wound is a deadly wound. I saw one of his heads as if it had been wounded to death. But notice what the rest of that verse says. But his deadly wound was healed. And after that, what happens? All the world marveled and followed the beast. Now, let me ask you a question. If you get a deadly wound, what happens to you? You die. You die. And if a deadly wound is healed, what happens to you? You are raised from the dead. Does that make sense, everyone? And so Jesus was slain and then resurrected. The Antichrist was wounded to death and then healed. But it gets even more amazing. We just read it. Remember I told you to take that verse and hang it on a hook in your mind? Matthew chapter 28 and verse 17, that many people worshipped him after his resurrection. Many people, what, everyone? Worshipped him. So Jesus Christ receives worship after the... Resurrection, but what did we just read there? Look at it there. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Look at verse 4. So they worshiped the dragon, and the dragon is Satan. Satan. So they worshiped Satan, who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast saying who is like the beast who is able to make war with him in other words no wonder they're saying who's like the beast who's able to make war with him he had been slain and resurrected so whoa whoa who could make war with him even if you knock him down he just rises up again even if he's slain he resurrects again you see this counterfeit theme and number eight Jesus Christ was given universal dominion. We already saw that. All authority, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Okay, do you see that? Now look at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 and notice verse 7. It says, It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And what is the next word? authority was given him over a couple few people, not very many people. What does it say? Authority was given him over every tribe and tongue and nation. That sounds like universal authority, doesn't it? It's exactly what it sounds like. Every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Jesus Christ gave, was given universal dominion. The Antichrist claims a counterfeit universal dominion. Do you see the counterfeits, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, so take a look at it. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, he raised from the dead. Let's go to our review here. Jesus Christ is worthy of our worship. Okay, here we go. And one more. See, I was ahead of myself. Powerful. Look at this. The Antichrist will not appear as a violent opposer, but as a subtle imposter. Are we clear on that, everyone? That's very interesting here. Go to the last page of your study guide. Last page of your study guide. It says the stage is set. We are now prepared to identify the Antichrist. The biblical picture is compelling and conclusive. In our next lesson, we'll give you 10 identifying characteristics of the Antichrist. We began this lesson with John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And we concluded that eternal life comes from knowing God. Amen? Amen. So then Satan's attack would be to prevent us from coming to know God. know God in a true way. 
This text makes it very clear that salvation is beautiful in its sublime simplicity. Salvation is based on a relationship of love and commitment between an individual and God. The plan of Satan through the Antichrist, in brief, is to obscure... What word is that, everyone? Obscure the person and place of Jesus and thus compromise or prevent altogether that relationship. The essence of deception is that one doesn't know that he or she is being deceived. deceived. So a person may actually believe that he has a relationship with God when in reality he may have been deceived by the Antichrist. The Bible is the cure for deception. Our relationship with God must be based on love and truth, biblical truth. Can you say amen? Amen. This is what Jesus meant when he said in John chapter 4 that we must worship in spirit and in truth. Final paragraph. Bible truth makes our love for God intelligent. Intelligent. Can you say amen to that? Now, some people are going to be satisfied to worship God in any old willy-nilly way. But, beloved, God wants to be worshipped in the way that He asks us to worship Him. Right? Think of Cain and Abel there in the Garden of Eden. Both of them brought an offering to the right God. Isn't that true? I mean, Cain brought his offering to the right God. He just brought the wrong thing. He didn't bring what God had asked him to. And I can imagine Cain saying, well, you know, God will understand. I mean, God's a big boy. He'll understand and appreciate. I mean, surely. And so he brings uh, his thing, uh, the, the, the first fruits of the field, and God rejected it. Why? Because God's a great big meanie? No, 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 no. Because that's not what God had asked for. Now, some of us have parents that just let us get away with, with whatever we wanted to get away with. And we had parents that said, you know, my, my dad wasn't that way. I, I hear that there are parents that way. But I, my dad was 36 years in the military. He had an index finger about that long, and he'd point it at me all the time. He'd say, boy, just like that, okay? Now, now think this through, beloved. God asks us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, that doesn't mean, well, you know, I'm going to worship God how it makes me feel good and blah, blah, blah. Listen, you might be worshiping God in a way that makes you feel good, but if it's not in a way that's biblical, you are in danger of being deceived. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, that's the world in which you live. The, 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 the culture, the society in which we live says that, hey, if it's true for you, it's fine. You've heard that ridiculous saying. It's, it's an absolute affrontery to the English language. People say, well, you know, that's true for you, but it's not true for me. That doesn't even make sense grammatically. Something is either true or it's not true. Well, you know, two plus two is six for you, but for me, it's three. No, 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 no. Listen, I come from a different day and age. I mean, I come from a day and age and, you know, I'm a whole 34 years old and so everyone older than me will understand exactly what I'm talking about. When I was in math class, we would have to go up to the board and do the problems that were on the board. Does anybody remember this? In front of the whole class, you know, nine times nine and you're going up there, you know, just absolute fear, absolute trepidation, all of the students looking in, you know, every student in the classroom knows the right answer and you can't remember if it's 81 or 82 and you get up there and you, you say, 80. Two, and you write it down, and, and the teacher said, wrong. <laughs> Nowadays, the teacher would say, well, that's another way of looking at it. <laughs> you know, David, I just want to affirm your creative and out-of-the-box thinking. Good job, class. Let's just all, woo, good for, no, not, not, not the society I grew up in, not the school system I went to. That was wrong. But in today's day and age, we, well, we don't want to make the kid feel bad. Or, listen, I want him to feel terribly bad. If he's going to go on and become an engineer and design a bridge, I want him to know his math. <laughs> Amen? Amen? That's the world we live in, beloved. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Listen, God doesn't want to hurt anybody's feelings either. But God gives us truth in his word. And if what God says is A, and we say, well, I prefer B, shame on you. So, well, you know, I think God understands, you know, I, I think God, listen, God does understand. God understands that he told you what to do. He made it clear what he wanted you to do, and you didn't do it. He understands just fine. 
Beloved, the Bible is not hard to understand. But there are going to be many people at the end of time who will be deceived, not because God's Word wasn't clear, but because they just went about it their own way. They made it, well, you know, I'll do my own thing. No, 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 no. God makes His commands and His teachings and His truths clear. Can someone say amen? amen. And if everything we believe is grounded and rooted in this word, there is no danger. There's what did I say, everyone? No, no danger of being deceived. No danger, amen? Amen. If everything you believe, come, if everything I believe as a Christian, every single thing I do, everything I believe, I can give you a plain, thus saith the Lord for it. I don't say, well, you know, that's the way my church does it. Well, that's the way my pastor does it. Well, that's just the way I prefer it. No, 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 no. Everything I believe comes from what the Bible says. Amen? And you should do the very same thing. Many people go looking for a church that fits them. Well, I want to find a church where I'm comfortable. A church where you're comfortable. Find a church where they're teaching the truth, beloved. Lord, have mercy. Uh, you, got, you can be comfortable every other day of the week, beloved. Go find a church that's teaching the truth. Maybe say, oh, I'll find a church and hopefully it's comfortable for me. No, first find the truth and then go find a church that's teaching what's true, not the other way around. Jesus himself had to change churches. Jesus began his earthly ministry and he said, take these things out of here. You've made my father's house a den of thieves. He began his earthly ministry. It was my father's house. But at the end of three and a half years, he went back into that same temple and he walked out and he said, your house is left to you desolate. Why? Why had he changed? Because they had consistently rejected the evidences of his messiahship. He says, if you won't follow the truth, I'll take my show somewhere else. Hallelujah. Are we clear? We say, well, I'm going to say, you know, my grandpa went to this church. My, my grandmother, she played that organ. And uh, my uncle, he made that stained glass. And oh, good for you. Beloved, God, uh, Jesus Christ himself went into the very temple that was built and designed as an edifice to show him. But when truth wasn't being taught there anymore, he took his 12 disciples and he went and met under, met under an oak tree. Amen. Because truth is more important than a building. Amen. And that's not the world you live in, though. The world you live in says, well, you know, truth smooth. I mean, come on, we all get along. I mean, the Bible is so hard to understand. There are so many different interpretations. How many of you have heard that before? Well, that's your interpretation and this is mine. Let me tell you something. There are only two kinds of interpretations, right and wrong. Well, that's just your interpretation of nine times nine. Mine's a little different, you know. My, you know, my interpretation is that it's 84. No, no, no. We're not, it's, the Bible says there is no private interpretation, 2 Peter chapter 1. Whoo, you got me fired up. See how that works? <laughs> Beloved, there is a real danger. The devil is not whistling Dixie. He is out to deceive. And deceived people are unaware that they're being deceived. And again, you're, you're, you're sitting there tonight thinking, man, I'm just so glad I'm not deceived. That's how every deceived person in the world thinks. The moment that you know you're being deceived, you're undeceived. Make sense? Because now you're aware of it. It's just like when you wake up and think, oh, I was sleeping. Yeah, now you're awake. And the Antichrist comes in to subtly, what word, everyone? to subtly counterfeit Christ. People have this ridiculously obvious elementary idea that the Antichrist is going to come on the scene with a great big sign around his neck that says, Antichrist, I hate Jesus. Honk if you don't love Jesus. And everybody's going to say, oh, there's the Antichrist. Oh, don't have anything to do with him. Are you kidding? The Antichrist comes on the scene not to show himself that he's against God, but that he is God. He's a religious figure like a Judas Iscariot, not who will violently oppose, but who will subtly betray. And Revelation sets us up for this. Jesus began his ministry by rising from the water. The Antichrist begins his mission by rising from the water. Jesus resembles his father. The Antichrist resembles his father. Jesus has horns and crowns representing kingly authority. The Antichrist, horns and crowns representing kingly authority. Jesus received his authority from who? The father. The Antichrist receives his authority from who? The dragon. That's exactly right. And then number five, here we go. Jesus' ministry lasted three and a half literal years. The Antichrist ministry lasts three and a half prophetic years. Jesus was slain, then 
resurrected. The Antichrist was wounded to death, then healed. Jesus receives worship after the resurrection. The Antichrist received worship after his deadly wound was healed. Jesus is given universal dominion. The Antichrist claims universal dominion. What you're seeing here is a counterfeit, an imposter, and that's why we ask the question, does Jesus Christ have a twin? The answer is no, but if the Antichrist has his way, you'll think so. Are we clear, everyone? Two questions as we close tonight. Number one, has this been clear? Yes or no? Raise your hand if it's been clear. Okay, good. Second question is this. How many of you, and I'm not just, listen, I'm not up here for my good health, and I don't make a penny off of these meetings. That's, I could care less about all that. I want to know how many of you are committed to taking everything that you believe, everything that you stand on in your experience, your religious experience with God, and saying, if it's not traceable to here, I'm willing to give it up. Come on now, slowly, wind the crank. Are you with me? Beloved, that's dangerous. What you just did there is dangerous. Look, my hand's up. My hand's up. Beloved, if, it, if it's not in here, it's not worth believing. Amen? This is the essence and the elixir of deception. In today's day and age, you go to many churches, they place a bigger emphasis on feeling good than on doing good. I've been to churches where I've said, open your Bible to the book of Hezekiah. And everybody starts to look, oh yeah, Hezekiah, that's in the New Testament, right? There is no Hezekiah. <laughs> Beloved, we need to know this word. We need to love this word. We won't be here tomorrow night, but we will be here on Monday. We're going to look at the actual, certain, definite, unavoidable identity of the Antichrist. And it won't be from me. It'll be from the word. I guarantee that. Amen? I won't tell it to you. You'll tell it to me. So bring a friend, bring an enemy, don't bring a pet, bring anyone. <laughs> we'll see you on Monday night. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to know what's true. And so please, Father, give us a passion for your word. Father, we live in a society, in a world, in a culture that is turned upside down. And what's wrong is right, and what's right is wrong, and everything in between. But Father, you are calling us to know truth. You tell us that your church is the pillar and ground of truth. We want to know what's true. So help us, Father, tonight as, as, as we bring our hearts to you, we bring our lives to you, we bring our worship to you. Father, refine us. And make us willing to let go of the dearest things if they can't be traceable to your word. Father in heaven, bind our hearts together with your heart. And bind our hearts together with one another in Christian love. Oh God, we love you. Teach us how to love you more and better. In Jesus' name, let all of God's humble people say,